Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to the second session of Design Fiction's Future Epidemiologies, Ethical Responses, and Public Health. Um, this is a studio session series produced by the UC San Diego Design Lab and the Visual Arts Speculative Design Program. I'm Stephanie Sherman, a PhD candidate in BizArts Spec Design and also a designer within the Design Lab Automation and Community Teams. I'm really thrilled to welcome back everyone who's returning to the series after a tremendous session last week and to welcome those of you joining us to the series for the first time. The UC San Diego Design Lab is a center for human and user-centered design research, education, and community development, focused particularly on design for large-scale socio-technical systems. The Visual Arts Speculative Design Program is a track within the Visual Arts Department that brings together art, media, and design futuring methods. The goal for Design Lab Studio Sessions is to introduce new ideas and practical working methods that have real world applications, whether through industry, policy, or public sectors. This series on future epidemiologies and public health responds to a number of inquiries that have been at the forefront of conversations within the Design Lab this year. How to design for the redistribution of power, how to design against privilege and bias, how to support ethical responses to complex situations across scales. Um, we have with us today UCSD undergrads, faculty and staff, as well as folks joining us from places, universities further afield. And so in that spirit of interdisciplinarity, we encourage you to ask questions, seek clarification if terms don't make sense, um, but also be open to challenging some of your deepest held presumptions about what's good and bad, possible, probable um, in the first place. Uh, for those of you who have requested closed captioning, you can click on the live button on the top of your screen and you should see the transcription pop up in a new tab. Um, it's also important to note that we're recording these sessions and we will likely post them publicly to the Design Labs website in the near future. I have had the pleasure of co-producing this series with my fellow visual arts PhD candidate, Jonah Gray, under the curatorial leadership of Lisa Cartwright and by the instigation of the Design Lab's Camille Nebenecker, who will host sessions the third and fourth week respectively. So again, thanks to the Design Lab and the Visual Arts Department for their support. And now a brief introduction of today's session called Omnipolis Social Trust Planetary Health, which is led by Pinar Yoldis. Pinar Yoldis is an infradisciplinary designer, artist, and researcher. Her work develops within biological sciences and digital technologies through architectural installations, kinetic sculpture, sound, video, and drawing, with a focus on posthumanism, eco nihilism, Anthropocene, and feminist techno science. Um, she has an amazing litany of degrees, with a PhD from Duke University, where she was affiliated with the Institute of Brain Sciences and Media Arts and Sciences. She has a Bachelor's of Architecture from Middle East Technical University, a Master of Arts from Bilgi University, a Master of Science from Istanbul Technical University, and a Master of Fine Arts from UCLA, where she worked at the Art Science Center and the UCLA, UCLA Game Lab. She is now an assistant professor of visual arts at UCSD and um, as a huge admirer and fan of her work, it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. So thanks, Pinar. Welcome everyone. Thank you, Stephanie. I just wanna make sure that everything is working. Welcome everyone. Could you please give me a reaction like this? If you can hear me clearly, and next, when I share my slides, if you can see the slides clearly. All right, I can see the thumbs up. Awesome, that's great. Now let's go to the next test. Can you see my slides clearly? Oh, actually, when I do that, I block Zoom, so I can't see anything. If you could just say, yes, we can see it. That would be helpful. No, we can't. No, we no. can't see anything yet. No. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, welcome. No, no, no we cannot. Oh, you see. can't. You cannot see the slides. All right. 
let's try one more time because the slides without slides i am nothing i slide therefore i am so let's see um let's try this one now let's go to desktop to share and can you see the slides yes, yes. Okay, so the slides are working and I can see you guys. So it solved two problems at once. This is wonderful. So um, this is a very timely series, I have to say. It's a very timely uh, workshop. Um, I don't know if, I know uh, most of you aren't perhaps in San Diego or even in California right now, but um, we are in the midst of uh, wildfires here. We are all a bit broken. The sun looks uh, a different color, right? Um, these are just some images uh, that I encountered yesterday. I actually went out to grab a picture for this uh, workshop myself, but I, I couldn't catch a good image. Um, we are a bit broken in this time on top of uh, COVID uh, because perhaps our causality is broken. So. There's a lot of um, issues that we're faced with right now, and I hope that this workshop will help uh, tackle some of them immediately in the you know, uh, duration of this workshop. Now, the title is A Mouthful on Nepalis, which is a term that I'm borrowing um, from a French philosopher, right? And uh, I just realized that while I was preparing for this and I was writing a text, uh, Paul Virilio, that he actually meant something a little different. <laughs> so I got the concept wrong, but we'll talk about that. Uh, social trust, uh, which became more and more important uh, during COVID and planetary health, which is kind of the background uh, for all of this. Um, I missed an hour of Ben's talk last week, unfortunately. So uh, if uh, I, don't, I hope it will be more of an overlap situation than a repetitive situation. What I'll do in the next two hours uh, is to give you uh, uh, groups of uh, audiovisual information on spec design and how this new um, trend, movement, branch, whatever it is, can tackle something as pervasive as uh, a pandemic. Although spec design has been um, seen more of an intellectual position or has been stated as more of an intellectual position than a bundle of helpful design tools and methodologies, I'll do my best to prove otherwise. Um, now, a note about me, uh, I'm an unlicensed architect with a BArch from Middle East Technical University. Before that, I was trained as a young scientist in the college for gifted kids and my specialization was chemistry. Post-architecture, I collected degrees as uh, is Stephanie just uh, highlighted in visual communication design media arts and I finally did my PhD at Duke University on computational media and neuroscience uh, but most of my world building and spec design experience is either self-taught or it comes from my time as an architect and a media artist because uh, when I started this business of spec design the term uh, didn't exist yet. Uh, the methodology I use is inspired by cognitive science, uh, affective neuroscience, and embodied cognition. And I believe that as a designer, uh, the most precious material uh, that I can get my hands on is not carbon nanotube fibers, ivory, or gold. Who would use ivory anyways? It's hideous. Uh, but brain matter. So uh, I sometimes call myself a synaptic sculptor as opposed to a speculative designer. Now, um, we will start with the awakening, the awakening of the designer. Uh, when did this happen? It happened in the last, uh, let's say, 20 years or so. Um, there was this uh, new phenomenon, this realization that the designer no longer attempts to generate answers, but instead aims to formulate really great questions. I'm talking about kind of the uh, spread of uh, first, let's say, critical design, uh, which now became, uh, which now uh, is known as speculative design, according to Dune and Raby, who wrote this book, Speculative Everything. Uh, they came up with the term critical design in the mid 90s. Uh, but then out of concerns, uh, they urge uh, with the technological progress and how we shouldn't embrace it all and be uh, more critical. That's how they came up with it, right? 
uh, but then they updated it um, as a spec design uh, maybe a decade later. I might be wrong with the dates. And now uh, this term, not only we have an established department uh, you know, with the same name, but also it's um, a term that designers are trying to understand. They're looking at it. I've seen a lot of articles or I've had a lot of people come to me and ask me, oh, can I take spec design and apply to UI UX? Can I take spec design and apply it to product design, etc." So it's this, um, you know, almost enigmatic branch, right? But again, as we can see from this um, quote, the main, one of the main premise and also looking at the literature about this is that the designer no longer attempts to generate answers, but instead aims to formulate really great questions, right? So that's very important. Now, I just, you know, had to put this here, uh, Checo, uh, Anton Checo, once said the role of the artist is to ask questions, not answer them. So I, I see this is the awakening of the designer to realize that they're kind of artists. So this causes confusion, right? Is okay, so is the designer the artist? Uh, that is the designer, uh, is, is designer also an artist or is an artist also a designer? And if everybody's asking questions, who is answering that, right? So these are some of the things that come up. And um, also being based in the night department, I find myself also uh, tackling with this, right? Now, as uh, is speculative designer and artist. Well, um, actually calling an artist a spec designer, vice versa, uh, could be a bad thing. Uh, Dune and Raby don't like this at all. Uh, I'm more open to just, you know, um, I, I just kind of don't care that much. You'll see in the next couple of slides. But um, they disagree with this, uh, although both are asking questions and they are uh, not answering questions, primarily asking questions. A spec designer is not an artist. Uh, Dune and Raby's uh, response is that, well, they won't take it as seriously. I, I'm solid proof of this because when I try to rent an apartment, when I say I'm an artist, People look at me and they're like, okay, there's so many people applying to this unit. Thank you for your attention. And when I say I'm a designer, they're like, okay, here's the you know, form. You can fill it and send it to me. So, um, but they are very different things. And uh, there's a, a chart from last week, which explained why a designer, a spec designer, especially is not an artist. So I took that chart from Ben's presentation and I added some more bubbles on it because I thought there weren't enough bubbles on the chart already. Now, um, as you see in this uh, chart, there is uh, the main axis that's perhaps separating art, which is indicated with a very large bubble, although the scale is, of in, uh, is, not, of indicative, uh, is not indicative of sign uh, significance. And strategy is on the other side. It's more cons constrained, right? So looking at this chart, we can think that um, the less constraints you have, right, uh, the more art it is, the more artists you, you can ask any question, not just a question, right, it can be anything. And the more constraints you have, uh, you're more on the world of um, design with capital D, right, design thinking, design future strategy and whatnot. But, I thought about this and I just, you know, looking at my experience and look, looking at the experiences of artists around me and designers around me, perhaps this constraint on constraint can be uh, opened up a little bit more. Maybe we can unpack what constraint means, right? And uh, this is also my reading uh, of a constraint from an ecoist, Marx-friendly viewpoint, right? Um, perhaps when we mean constraint, we're talking about more corporate, more commercial is more constrained, right? And less corporate, less commercial, commercial is less con uh, constrained because um, there are also many constraints that artists uh, tackle with. Now uh, let's talk about the uh, you know, phantom bubbles that I added here. Uh, spec design, again, is defined, uh, let's say, uh, you know, uh, in the, uh, uh, the, uh, the first half of the, uh, sorry, and around 2010s, et cetera, but there are other, uh, you know, precedents of this, like radical design. And one thing that I uh, noticed that was missing in this uh, diagram was uh, architecture. Because uh, this, you know, tools and methods, if we have any in spec design and the outputs, the way we generate, produce outputs, 
it's been uh, you know done in architecture actually starting around 60s and 70s even earlier there are many uh, early examples of this but i'm just going to focus on experimental architecture of 19 uh, late 60s and 70s uh, such as architecture practitioners like Lerbius Woods right and um, uh, architectural fiction as Bruce Sterling defined it in 2006 now we also have speculative architecture that's kind of a, a new domain uh, you know spearheaded by practitioners as Liam Young so there is that uh, but I want to offer a much simpler much simpler diagram for what a spec design is or could do. Uh, to me, anything that hasn't been built yet or built yet or hasn't been executed yet is speculative. So um, it's basically uh, between yesterday and tomorrow, right? And it's 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 about the present. Uh, it's it's uh, between uh, past and future. It's about now, right? Um, here is a diagram again um, that I am borrowing from June and Raby, uh, who borrowed uh, the diagram from Stuart Candy. And um, this is basically uh, what a spec design is offering, like the red area preferable and spec design is kind of brainstorming on what uh, this could be. Now the question we have to ask ourselves is what future are we in? Um, I mean, AI futures, health futures, what future are we looking at? Now, I want to, I asked, you know, a couple questions and I want to answer them also about spec design, because uh, these are some things I encountered, again, um, kind of you know, defining the field or uh, while uh, giving talks, etc. Is spec design collective dreaming? I disagree with this, uh, although some people claim it's collective dreaming. Um, a dream sounds wonderful and empowering, uh, especially when Martin Luther King roars, I have a dream. And um, it's been, spec design has been called uh, a collective uh, dreaming, but um, as good as it sounds, um, uh, dreams are actually uh, not about the future as much as we would like to think. Dreams are a brain's way of coping with past experiences, right? Our brains are organs of prediction. And um, although the uh, function or the processes of sleep and dreams is fully understood, there is one thing that we know for sure is that dreams are when declarative memory is consolidated. So even if our personal experience of dreams could be a fantastic journey to a land you've never been before or some odd juxtaposition of people and objects and places that don't go well together in your life. It's actually your brain, you know, um, turning your daily experiences, the stimuli you've been exposed to, the things you've read, the things you've been flashed, you know, the, the I don't know, even a stimuli that didn't register in you uh, at a conscious level, you know, being packed into meaningful uh, structures by the brain. So a dream is about the past. And um, I, it's our interpretation, basically, that gives the dream, that's the story that we as associate with it. And I think uh, spec design is, you know, as much as it looks at the past and understands and learns from the past, it's not a dream, just like talking about it in that sense. Um, now, the next question is, are speculative designers high on something like white privilege? Uh, could be, yes, uh, or cyclosibin, psych like, a, you know, a, a, a drug that is uh, experimentally used to treat uh, depression and anxiety, uh, could supposedly uh, uh, cause long-term changes, uh, uh, personality changes uh, in the dimension of uh, openness, because you know there are these five uh, dimensions of personality. So, uh, is, is spec design something like that, where you kind of like open up yourself uh, to uh, more possibilities? Maybe, maybe. Um, is speculative design like a new type of design? Is it like what Ashtanga is yoga? Is it basically kind of a trend where you're bored of practicing one thing in a certain way and now you're looking for a variation on it so that it's more fun. Not really uh, because it doesn't have that, as I said, you know, um, set of 
tools and methodology uh, that designers would like to adopt, especially for areas like, um, I know, systems design or UI UX design. Um, so, Last question, is it a trend, a style? In my opinion, uh, spec design is a starship traveling at one third speed of flight headed to Alpha Century. It's a long-term project. Uh, the visionary light that spec design offers may take years to build. Uh, so it's not about the past, right? It's, it's, it's not a drag, it's not something to make us feel good about our design skills. It's not just a trend or style, right? And it's a long-term project. So I see a lot of overlaps with spec design and architecture, actually, in terms of how many years, or uh, you know, spaceship design, in terms of how many years it could launch to uh, uh, take to design and launch something. Now I have an example from my own um, design library, uh, Fool's Fall. This is a project that I, um, you know, uh, built around 2013. Uh, the proposal is basically, um, why don't we take regular chicken and apply bio biological minimalism to it, uh, turn, it uh, turn the chicken into what we actually see it as, uh, AKA an egg machine or a meat machine. Because uh, you know it's obviously uh, very uh, visible to most of us, especially in this group, that um, domestic chicken Gallus domesticus is you know kept in these cages for uh, industrial uh, animal farming, and uh, they suffer all kinds of uh, nervous or muscular or health issues in general, right? And uh, chicken um, have brains, right? And then I was thinking about um, a neuroscientist who claims that um, brains evolved only to organize complex movement in a highly complex environment. Daniel Wolpert is the name of the neuroscientist. And by just bringing these things together, I realized that, well, we don't let the chicken to move, but we still give them this organ that um, you know, or, uh, organizes, controls their movement. Why don't we just take everything that uh, the chicken uses and, you know, in a, a typical natural setting, uh, let's say a pure Anthropocene setting that helps uh, the chicken move and look and find things, right? For instance, uh, eyes are also, uh, let's say, call them movement organs. Let's take the movement organs all out and the result is something like this. Right, and um, this is uh, basically an organic uh, structure, like a, a kind of a kettle. You can put it next to a kettle in the kitchen, and every 27 or 28 hours, uh, this uh, kind of, uh, let's call it product, will give you eggs, and um, it's basically subtracted to a, a reproductive system, and then a simple musculoskeletal system because you don't want just like a blob of flesh and you have to take the you know, egg out of it. It's like, no, let's just give it some structure. Let's make it still look nice, right? And um, the product basically has an output hole and an input hole where you can feed, you know, the, uh, this uh, entity um, with uh, whatever nutritious things you want. Because I see when I go in the grocery store, like there's omega enriched, uh, or I don't know, sodium, sodium is not good, uh, calcium enriched chicken, et cetera. And you can do that at home, right? Um, and it's practical and customizable. It's uh, full false, it's ethical, because there is no real suffering in that the brain and you know, most of the nervous system pain is gone. And, and simple, right? And um, so we will just look at perhaps uh, one more slide where you can actually also, uh, are not, you're not limited to the chicken feathers, which uh, I, I'm very fond of. The, you know, there's so many different varieties of chicken, so many different feathers, but let's say uh, macaws, also an endangered species, went extinct. You can, you know, uh, take that DNA that expresses these uh, feathers and put it on something like full spall. And you can have a kitchen appliance. Not only gives you kind of meat or eggs. This is primarily for eggs, actually. Uh, and then you can also look at beautiful, uh, you know, macaw feathers. So that was an example, right? And I, when I propose these projects, most of the time people are like, oh, it's a very nice joke, oh, it's clever, etc. 
but I'm dead serious. I, I, if I could build it, I would build it, right? So I'm just waiting and learning, and I'm waiting for that moment where perhaps um, gene uh, editing and you know creating an organism like this is uh, affordable. Um, is disruption a social function of design? These are two questions I'm going to answer before I move to the next part of my, um, uh, let's say, workshop. Uh, is disruption a social function of design? Um, I believe so, and I think this is something that we need to consider while we are, you know, embarking or while we uh, start thinking as a speculative designer, uh, what's the social function of the, you know, um, question or solution that I'm proposing. Um, now, the big question is who's the client, right? Because uh, um, as I mentioned earlier, is this uh, is spec design, it could be just, you know, a bunch of uh, privileged people being high on design because they can afford to do so. Because uh, there is, there could be more, no visible client. For, uh, for my experience and my so, uh, response to this question, who's the client is, um, it's uh, basically, whatever subject you're dealing with. So if I'm working on full stall designing, you know, um, simplified uh, chicken, uh, a suffering free chicken, right? Then the client is chicken. If I'm working on ocean plastics, pelagic plastics, then the client is the ocean. Now, uh, there are of course a lot of unknowns about how this could be monetized and how this could become uh, you know, a field is sustainable, but that's not uh, something I want to respond to uh, during this uh, workshop. I want us to kind of focus on our, um, you know, uh, problem sets. So now, uh, I want to also highlight experimental architecture and its connections to spec design, right? Um, so uh, experimental architecture, as I said, um, was um, something popular also call, called as uh, pinup architecture in uh, late 60s, 70s, right? And um, it creates a narrative context. This is something we definitely borrow from uh, speculative or experimental architecture. We also create as spec designers a narrative context. It's very important. Um, in architecture, there are also sites and events. So uh, this is something we can adopt as well. Like we can focus on the site immediately, right? Um, experimental architecture uh, relies heavily on representation, especially visual representation. So plant sections, elevations, 3D models, renderings. These are the tools of experimental architecture. And uh, spec design does the same. Actually, I put a, a huggable atomic mushroom here uh, by Dune and Raby. Um, as, as they propose that spec designers should make props. Uh, but um, it's been basically coming from architecture that you make models and, pres uh, you know, uh, sections, elevations. You think about the details, basically. Um, architecture uses storytelling via draftsmanship, craftsmanship, and right now, nowadays, you know, 4D, Maya, there's so many new uh, experimental architects out there. And um, spec design creates a sculptural effect, I would say. Uh, speculative architecture, experimental architecture, experimental design, both of them have a temporal focus, which is the future. Uh, architecture is starting with buildings and cities and uh, generating you know, uh, solutions uh, for the questions they ask around these topics. And uh, for spec design, it could be body systems. I left out objects, but of course, objects are part of it. Both of them are critical, but optimistic. Uh, Lebius Woods, whose drawings I'll show next, for instance, is a great example. He um, basically uh, tells us that he's, although it might look different, uh, it, differently, he's very optimistic. And both uh, fields may, might remain sterile. So what does that mean? Um, Again, uh, in the you know context of architecture, it means not uh, constructing buildings, right? For instance, uh, this is from uh, Lubus Foods, uh, one of his <laughs> hurricane cities, and um, he was really keen on staying sterile. And he you know mentions that multiple times that he's not interested in building these buildings, right? Uh, he's interested in envisioning them. Um, 
And here is uh, some of his designs. These are examples of kind of the pr principles that I just went through. Here are some examples of, again, from Libby's. I love Libby's foods, obviously. And uh, he's, he's the most talented, uh, you know, craftsman also, um, but a very solid uh, philosopher. And in uh, this, uh, on the, I think, to you left, I guess, uh, you see uh, two uh, establishments. These are actually residences uh, for Sarajevo. So Sarajevo was uh, being bombarded and the whole city went down actually. And he was um, thinking about, you know, rebuilding Sarajevo. Uh, a big chunk of his uh, projects are about that. But as you see, He's not just thinking, oh, I want these lines and this kind of smoke in the background and I'm creating a dark environment. No, he's also thinking about how can I build this? What are, where are the, you know, support structures? Where's the ceiling? How do I get to this place? If it's moving, where are the joints? How do I get, you know, air? And so all these architectural questions uh, that an uh, irresponsible architect has to answer, right, uh, for their client's safety and happiness he's already answering them. So I think this is something that's very important to me in spec design and could be dismissed. It's not just kind of, you know, as they said, like dreaming, ah, oh, nice things, or a, a new utopia or a dystopia, because there's also um, a lot of uh, spec design projects that are focused on, let's say, um, uh, negative outcomes, right? But the details on how to get there are also very important. So uh, it's not just about having a good idea, it's also about uh, taking the road to make it happen, right? And architects do that. So here is a, a beautiful uh, collection from Kazimir Melevich. No, actually, this is a Hadid, and I um, can't believe I typed her first name wrong. I am very sorry about that. But Zawa Hadid was a sterile architect and an experimental architect until um, her, I think, mid-40s, until the Vitro Museum. And her drawings um, basically were these um, landscapes, uh, you know, that were a very expressive uh, kind of thought processes, et cetera. And I think if one of these drawings is about the Vitro Museum, which was then built. So this was a way for her to uh, conceive these ideas. Another idea uh, slide, and again, I'm, uh, you know, uh, looking at architects who have uh, also a uh, focus on uh, environmental, you know, uh, planetary health and ecology. Um, this is uh, Ant Farm, right? And uh, from again, 1970s, uh, they dissolved now. Older Chip Lord is, I believe, at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, this is a dolphin embassy uh, to uh, promote social relations between humans and the dolphins. And the entire architecture is uh, basically, uh, you know, factoring in how, where the dolphins could come, if we're giving them food, how do we do it? How can we create playful experiences for them? Where can we put our labs when we do you know, our research or uh, when we have our interaction with them? How can we record, document these interactions? How can we learn from them? So uh, it's one of my uh, all time favorites actually. Now, um, this looks really, really bad compared to Dolphin Embassy, but this is a project that I'm working on right now called the Ocean Pavilion. And uh, it's a museum of the ocean. I call. I think it is a little bit speculative in that um, there are six chapters, and some of the chapters in the Ocean Pavilion um, are looking at a hollow ocean where all life uh, has left the ocean. Right. Um, another architect, Eugene Sui. Um, he also. I. All of these architects, I think, with the exception of Lebius Woods. I also did build buildings, and Eugene Sui is a Californian. He's in Bay Area. I think he's a very eccentric, eccentric character. He also designs his own clothing and uh, own kitchen appliances. Um, he thinks design should be smarter and um, should really look uh, at nature and learn from nature. So he's basically doing biomimicry again before biomimicry became a thing. And in this uh, solar residence, um, you can easily guess that the, the wings uh, of the building are helping uh, with the energy cost, taking the energy cost down. Um, this is Javier Nesonian. Uh, um, he actually has more built stuff than uh, Eugene Sui, but 
uh, you know, uh, he introduces the concept of organic architecture where architecture just like uh, takes a step uh, in the opposite direction to kind of hide itself in, you know, natural elements uh, to highlight the plant life. And I, I want to include this because plant life, uh, you know, designing um, lived experience around plant life is going to be one of our um, basically workshop uh, features. Of course, I have to talk about Archigram, right? Um, they are a uh, walking city on the ocean, for instance, and uh, this was, uh, we will see there are many iterations of this idea of like cities walking and settling, and but this was perhaps their response uh, to uh, you know, uh, the durumology that was increasing around the time, um, the changing definition of work and life, and uh, the transitory nature of a person in a city. And um, again, you know, the uh, picture on the right is uh, by Peter Cook, who is part of uh, Archigram, and you can see that the uh, you know ideas and or the aesthetic tendencies that they develop the solutions they develop through their archigram years are kind of uh, reflected in their built uh, work. Now um, I don't have sound for this, and I don't know if you watch this movie. Um, you don't have to, obviously. Um, this is I think Mortal Engines, uh, which was based on. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name, and I don't have it in my notes uh, on a novel. Um, written, I think maybe around the time Archigram was thinking about walking cities, so it could be written a little earlier. And uh, it has the city structure uh, where bigger moving cities consume smaller moving cities, yada yada. But as opposed to Archigram's walking cities, and uh, despite its visual appeal and the fantasy world it's creating, right, uh, it's basically taking class system and uh, the, the, the differences between the rich and poor as a spaces, so you're at the bottom, closer to the wheels, uh, you, if you're a poor person, or if you're, that's your social strata, but at the top, the rich are living this, uh, I don't know, glamorous, uh, idyllic, uh, you know, uh, slice of heavenly life. So, um, all, as much as it looks like it's speculative or it's even architectural, right, uh, to me at its core, it's not really questioning. It doesn't have that maybe a social function as much. Now, um, what's next? I mentioned these in my uh, blog uh, for this uh, workshop, so I had to add them. This is an illustration uh, for, for a short story called uh, The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas uh, by Ursula Le Guin. Um, it's one of my all time favorites, especially uh, you know, in terms of how it, um, you know, like any good literature, how it crystallizes our current condition and, uh, you know, um, high, uh, and gives us a story that's coherent. But one thing that's really important about the ones uh, who walk from Omelas, and I'm sorry that this is such a sh uh, fast workshop that we don't have time kind of to read and then contemplate and have discussions about this, is that she describes the architecture of the city very vividly. Right, as um, so vividly that actually an illustrator who reads the book can imagine it and or can draw it. So um, one uh, thing about Omelas is that it's a very uh, happy place. It's a place of joy, except for um, one child that kept at the center of Omelas uh, that's uh, smeared with feces and has bruises all over him and is malnourished and as probably uh, having, uh, you know, uh, mental function problems, can't speak, right? And uh, the entire happiness and joy and the beauty of Omelas depends on the misery of this child. As long as the child is miserable, Omelas will shine. So that's the ones who walk away from Omelas. Another, uh, let's say, um, speculative, uh, uh, you know, design scenario or a narrative. Of course, I'm going to H.P. Lovecraft's Arkham, right? And again, he dis uh, defines it so well that we can build um, these uh, cities. And from Arkham, and it's kind of closer in terms of the uh, neighborhood, I'm moving to New York. Uh, this is, I think, 1966. Please correct me if I'm wrong when New York suffered from smog. 
uh, causing thousands to die. And um, the next uh, kind of fictional environment I want to talk about is New York. And it was very easy. If I must, if I should write a book about, you know, spec architecture, I should just focus on New York because we have um, thousands of visualizations, million dollar renders of New York, you know, under ice or I don't know, alien robots and all of that. Uh, but this one especially um, is uh, worth noticing because it's ac actually pretty let's say, um, realistic, it's pretty serious. Uh, this is from the Expanse uh, book series, which became an uh, Amazon uh, TV series, which was, uh, I think, uh, personally backed by uh, Jeff Bezos because he thought that uh, the establishments and like the, you know, uh, the places, uh, the system that uh, the, a uh, novel offers is pretty realistic and akin to his uh, vision of how, you know, uh, space travel or colon colonizing space should be. So that's the topic of another conversation. But um, in this uh, set, I have a picture of uh, their, uh, you know, uh, vision of Mars, their spec design for Mars. Uh, you can tell that it's the one with the red earth beneath it. Uh, there is a render of a uh, series, which is a, a city. Uh, call, uh, in the asteroid belt, obviously there is like a group of uh, you know people who live in a place called asteroid belt, and they're mining that belt, and um, they are also uh, they have they're subject to different gravity conditions, etc. But the most important thing that I want to show here is New York, the depiction of New York. Earth is still Earth, and it's uh, you know uh, you know under the governance of UN and um, in this uh, films, what they try to do, and maybe if you pay close attention to the images, you'll see it, they uh, rendered New York after the flood. So they rendered New York after rising sea levels. What I like about this um, compared to the next, uh, you know, slides I'll show you is that New York is still New York, people are still living there, right? The catastrophe didn't just like kill all of it. And this is probably, something we've already experienced uh, during COVID, uh, right? Um, when a really bad thing happens, it's not going to happen as a big explosive event, right? It's not going to happen uh, overnight in, as in movies. It's going to happen over time, which means there'll be, uh, you know, um, slots for adaptation, growth, or uh, response. And we've been experiencing this, but in these two images, you see how, you know, the expanse world New York is the water levels are a little bit up and the, the current day uh, New York, uh, I have a water mark on it. And these are some more uh, images of uh, New York from expanse. And um, speaking of New York, I thought, you know, from experimental architecture, this could be a good uh, connection to uh, concepts such as rewilding or rethinking planetary health. And I found this article uh, which made a huge impact on me uh, when I saw it in 2009. This is an article from 2009. Some of you might have seen versions of this in social media with the wrong um, explanations, obviously. But um, this, uh, in this article, um, they basically uh, rendered uh, New York as how it would be in 1609 or 16. Yeah, around that time, uh, based on maps uh, that they found. So this wasn't, again, uh, you know, we could think of it as also a speculative uh, design or architecture project, but um, really well uh, document, uh, following really, uh, really good documents and following um, expertise on cartography, et cetera. So this is Times Square, right? Uh, long before it became a symbol of Manhattan's hectic pace, the intersection where 7th Avenue crosses Broadway was once a quieter place, is what the text reads. I'm reading it in case uh, you can't see it. So they basically went to the exact locations to these renders and they created the renders based on, you know, um, the maps uh, that they used, for instance, uh, this map from 1782. And uh, what they did was they also removed all, let's say, military or uh, residential places on the maps uh, to go even uh, further in time. Let's go back to, uh, to the next one. Um, 
And uh, while reading this article, I also realized that um, there were uh, basically uh, a lot of wildlife in New York, most of which was uh, basically uh, erased uh, due to uh, fur trade, right? That's something else they t uh, talk about. So these are other images. And um, one other kind of, uh, you know, really, I think, important um, Note we have to make in terms of understanding how New York uh, started like that and ended like this is, I mean, in a vertical di dimension is uh, Ram Colas' is Delirious New York, where um, he shows us that the idea of vertical farming is not something new, right? And it was something that uh, really, uh, uh, how to say it, um, boosted or supported this idea of uh, taller buildings, buildings that go up in the sky, because the paradigm of lift space wasn't vertical at the time. But uh, this notion of vertical farming where, and you know, New York was New Amsterdam, a, a, Palestine, a kind of a Dutch providence, uh, these uh, Dutch people thinking that they could have their own farm and each in their own, you know, uh, kind of, uh, segmented vertical unit uh, was one of the uh, driving forces behind the verticalization of New York, right? Um, he even talks about, you know, people fearing that their cows would fall and what would happen if cows fell from these vertical farms. Now, um, I'm going to basically now talk about, go back to COVID a little bit more because um, the beginning of COVID especially was very interesting and perhaps emotionally charged for us. And uh, one of the things that um, really, you know, um, grabbed my attention was all these posts and social media about how uh, wildlife was taking over, it's specifically using that terminology, like animals are taking over, wildlife is taking over, taking over what? Oh. They are taking over what once belonged to them, etc. So this was kind of like the common sentiment, right? And um, I thought about this because uh, it was also presented as a silver lining to what was happening. Okay, we're all locked in our homes and this is horrible, but um, we are, I was just showing you a, a clip from I Am Legend, another New York post-apocalyptic, but with gazelles and others uh, type of thing, but the image quality might not be that good, right? Um, so, uh, and then we started uh, seeing a surge of images that showed how, you know, uh, nature just needed time to heal and it was, she was energized and Mother Earth was now revitalized because humans were at their homes, you know, uh, feeling their fingers, uh, thinking about toilet paper, nature is taking advantage of this and coming back. Um, of course, there are all, uh, many images of uh, wildlife walking back into the cities, like deer, I don't know, swans, etc. Even one thing that was really uh, funny for me was um, dolphins showing up in Venice. And then I found this one where there's an alligator in Venice. And I actually saw this image without the alligator in it, it's called a Photoshop. But um, not only we really wanted to believe that wildlife was taking over or taking what taking back what once belonged to it we kind of cherished it it was uh, you know a moment of psychological relief in the midst of what was going on oh you know the beaches in brazil for instance they're empty now or argentina and now these marine birds can come back oh the uh, turtles can now lay their eggs because uh, they won't be bothered by uh, people oh the dolphins are coming ba back to bosphorus or venice because now the waters are clean and it just happened in one month. It's magical, this is the power of nature. Uh, you know, as long as we like, uh, believe in the power of nature, we, we, uh, a happy future, a bright future is possible, yada, yada. So it all sounds good, but uh, again, when you dig deeper into it, first, some of those images aren't uh, real, right? We live in the age of fake news. Uh, second, most of the species that kind of showed up or took uh, took over what once belonged to them, were already there, right? They just um, didn't have to, they just had more space to roam, basically. And rewilding in and of itself is not something that can happen overnight so fast, but it's a concept. 
it's something that's in the zeitgeist and i especially see this a lot with younger designers this kind of uh, aesthetic of you know lush vibrant powerful nature taking over built environments right um these are some uh, videos that i basically collected uh, from instagram Oops, let's go back to it. I don't know if I can turn down the sound, but especially this one. And uh, why are these images important? Was I like really looking for, oh, artists, artists rendering of wildlife or something? No, I wasn't. These were, these images went super viral when they came out. So uh, of course you can claim that, well, cats go viral too, but What's interesting about this is that um, the set of images and artists who are kind of like taking built environments and rewilding them digitally, it's kind of a genre and it's um, finding um, a lot of, let's say, acceptance. And I, I see this as solid proof that it's in the same category as us seeing dolphins in the uh, Venice canals and like smiling, right? Oh yeah, this is possible, we can go back. But at the same time, uh, the notion of rewilding it's something that's been happening, especially in Europe, in a more systematic way, right? And uh, there are uh, plans and policies uh, for introducing uh, five uh, top predators back to Europe's forests, also plans on um, building uh, very large national parks while we're shutting them down over here, right? And, and turning areas and buying land and turning it into uh, wildlife so that uh, these ecosystems can flourish back. Um, now back to COVID, I don't want to speak way too long, so I'm gonna just do this very fast. Uh, what I'd like every group to do is, uh, we're gonna have groups, right? I want you to draw a COVID iceberg. So I want this to be an exercise where you think, uh, where you kind of focus on how, what COVID is symptom symptomatic of right um as opposed to just like approaching it as a, a single singled out uh, point in time and space like what are the things around it or beneath it that is supporting COVID that led to COVID right now uh the big questions that we asked were the story when did it start how did it start did it start in the Chinese lab or was it well wet markets now um why now is the question that I also want you to think about uh when we are you know uh, brainstorming in uh, our uh, during our ex exercise right it's, i call it cultural self in inspection it's not collective inspection it's uh, basically uh, self inspecting our uh, cu culture and perhaps its biases right there's the science to it how does it work governance how do we live with it and this is something that we have been talking of, uh, t talking about a lot actually how do we live with it is very important and when does it end? So these are some questions I want to think about uh, in the framework of story, you know, inspection and how it ends. Um, now, the question, the big question is, can design solve COVID-19? I think um, to answer this question, we can ask, can design solve, can design ever solve anything? If your answer is yes, then the answer is yes. Now, the question that I find even more important than the first question is can design solve culture or resolve culture? Um, is culture a problem? Is going to be the next question that follows this, right? And I, my personal answer, yes, it is. Our current global culture is a burning nexus of problems. And um, I personally think that design can not only solve COVID, it can also solve culture. Design and designers are cultural producers and we can design a new culture that addresses all these problems, right? Um, now, I asked this question before, uh, wh what future are we in? I believe we're in the COVID-19 futures or COVID futures. This is our future now. There's, uh, you know, it won't help to kind of like uh, forget this. And uh, pretty much any design idea, any uh, I know, project, anything that we will embark on from this point on, we'll have to tackle with COVID. So it's pervasive, it's above all of us. Um, now, 
here is the exercise part of the workshop. And um, let me explain this a little bit. And for some of the groups here, I have some examples. How is everybody doing? I just, when I talk, I just talk for 47 minutes. It's unbelievable. Is everybody doing okay? Thumbs up, clap. Okay, you're alive. That's great. Thank you. Um, great. So this is the fun part of the lecture, right? Um, I would like you to form groups obviously and um wh what i'd like is uh, to for each group and this may or may not work this is kind of a loose guideline but i want each group to have uh, three people or three roles uh, if you're a group of two you can divide the roles as well uh, one is a cartographer so this person in the group uh, will be the map maker right and um i don't want you to kind of like download something from Google Maps and like scribble on this. It's a map, it could also be kind of a mind map, right? Uh, but the cartographer will be thinking about basically how different entities that you're designing are connected to each other, right? Now, uh, the other uh, role is the, the role of the analyst. Uh, and the analyst will be basically, um, you know, um, kind of having, uh, maybe a more critical tone, like asking more questions perhaps in the group, but I also want the analysts to, uh, for their, you know, final presentation, uh, like look at images, down, you know, uh, get some resources online very quickly. We won't have much time for the workshop, but I will give you about half an hour and it's enough for a quick brainstorming session. So the analysts will do that. And the magician is the third person. And the magician's role is basically, um, to kind of think about how this can be built. How, what are some steps towards realizing this, this idea, right? That's why I call this person the magician. Now, as I said, the roles can, are fluid and the number is also fluid, but groups of three usually works well or groups of uh, five. I don't know how many people we have right now here. And the topics we have are, uh, here, I'm going to explain what I mean by one of these. I'm going to explain what you're, uh, you know, uh, focusing on uh, in a second. So I want us as a group uh, to think about a lived environment. And I totally did not talk about Omnipolis, didn't I? Did I? I totally skipped Omnipolis. Okay, I'm going to talk about it when I perhaps talk about stargazing. Um, and social trust is here. Uh, now, these are basically... Um, you know, originated from this idea that there are, in our everyday experience, there are always things that kind of bother us, perhaps. Like, you know, oh, I wish this payment didn't end here. Oh, I wish they moved that junction there. Like, think, thinking about the city. Oh, I wish I didn't have to drive to that location. I wish I could walk to it. Like, there are these things and perhaps repeating uh, concerns that we all have, right? And then there are also things that we might be intellectually bothered by. Uh, for instance, I don't know, uh, slaughtering dolphins as bycatch, uh, therefore you, you, you're like not happy with eating fish, etc. And um, what I want you to do is, you know, in each group, uh, uh, under a topic that you will choose, uh, I want you to think about, you know, what are the things that bother me or what are the things that I automatically find myself thinking about? Right, uh, those will be kind of your natural tendencies towards solving the problem, right? Or towards generating answers, uh, sorry, questions, right? Because that's what the spec designer does. Now, um, for wildlife, for instance, let me see. Let's, let's start with um, Afik. So for Afik, for instance, when we're designing a, a, a city, right? Uh, we will look at how um, you know factoring in uh, affect and emotion could change our lived experience now maybe i should step back i think in this workshop what i want you to think about is the connection of covid 19 to our urban structures right uh, because our urban structures really determine a lot of things for us and um, this is a type a structure that's been repeated globally and that could also be a problem, right? Or, or a solution. So what I want you to think about is design kind of a living environment. It could be one unit or a neighborhood or like a bigger scale, right? Or a country, uh, which focuses on 
wildlife only or affect only. I don't want you to address everything. I want you to kind of have a laser sharp focus on whatever title you're choosing. Respiratory health only, extreme heat only, which is something uh, you know, very uh, relevant right now. Or flora, plants only. What if I designed a neighborhood where all the design decisions that I'm making is based on uh, you know, the well-being of plants or flourishing more plants? Right. What if plants were basically your clients for designing this environment? Another one is play. What if you know we designed um, again an, a, a system, a lived experience where every object, everything we have, every, you know, our houses, our cities, roads, our connections to each other are designed around play. So I want you to kind of like just focus on these uh, subjects. Some of them are, I think, easier to think. Easier meaning very visible some of them might be more conceptual i want to start with um play sorry i want to start with affect and i don't know if don is still here but i brought this don this is from the cover of your emotional design book and um i'm really a big fan of understanding affect and emotion and its role in decision making and its role in you know design now, um, this is a very kind of well-known uh, experiment, but let's just uh, try it together, and I don't know how it will work with Zoom, but uh, these are two shapes, and they have two different names, right? One of them is called Kiki, and the other one is called Booba, and if you've seen this 5,000 times before, please stay with me. Um, so, which one do you think is called Kiki and which one do you think is called Booba? So now I don't know if I can draw on my screen, but the one that's globular, what do you think that one is called? Do you think it's called Kiki? Hands. Do you think it's called Booba? All right, I see, I see a satisfactory number of fans that say that the, the undulated one is booba. And yes, uh, most people when asked about this respond that way, um, cross-culturally. And uh, the softer one is you know, uh, thought of as booba and the one with the sharp edges like an explosion is thought of as kiki. So uh, I think at the core of emotional design as a principle is that uh, just like we have two arms, we have bilateral symmetry in the lungs and they work in a certain way. Our affect and affective systems and emotional systems are also working in similar ways. And understanding this, right, uh, could help us um, design environments that are uh, really, uh, you know, geared towards affect. Now, color is an easy one for this, so I picked some interior design examples but it could go way beyond that, such as, you know, design objects, some of them want you to kind of touch them or some of them make you happy, like they have bright colors or soft edges, right? Uh, so it can turn into a stylistic expression immediately, but emotion can also be a negative emotion. And again, like something uh, that we can easily do is think about our experiences living in a city, me being a woman and small, and growing up in Turkey where, you know, I wasn't really allowed to go out at night when I'm walking in the dark, for instance, and uh, the fluorescent street lamp is just, blue. okay, I am experiencing fear, right? Is it possible to design neighborhoods or cities or, you know, uh, lived experiences where, for instance, a feeling of security uh, is hi heightened or a feeling of fear in social space doesn't exist, right? Can we design spaces for, let's say, joy? Can we design spaces for, I don't know, uh, some negative affect as well? Uh, or how do we switch from positive affect to negative affect? So these are questions that we can think about. Now, stargazing is something I think that's uh, more direct. Uh, our, it's very obvious, we all know about this, light pollution, right? What if uh, we designed a lived environment only thinking about uh, being able to see the stars at night? What kind of things we would have to change immediately? And what are the you know, implications, repercussions of only thinking about seeing the stars? And what kind of culture this would lead us to? 
again, connecting to emotional design and my fear in the dark, you know, the reason we have streetlights everywhere and in abundance sometimes is because we might not have social trust. Something bad might happen to us, right? Obviously, it's not going to be a saber-toothed tiger. So is it possible to be able to, you know, design cities only uh, considering that stargazing is the thing we want to do? Now, uh, same approach for flora, right? I want you to think about... And I know maybe some of you picked up some gardening during COVID. That's something I did. I'm still not very good, but I, you know, had some tomatoes and stuff for starters. So what if you, we design our lived environment around plants, starting from interior to exterior or our campus, like we can think about UCSD campus is, uh, you know, plant life, the number one consider consideration in our campus, probably now. So what if it was like, what kind of things we would think about? Now, the next one is respiratory health. And I think this is significant uh, for two reasons. A, we know that there's a correlation between uh, how people are impacted uh, with, uh, with the virus, uh, especially uh, uh, how they're impacted with the virus and you know, uh, the environment um, uh, they live in. If, it's an air, uh, if there's air pollution and if there's respiratory health problems in the overall public, then they got affected more because uh, it was a respiratory disease, right? What if we design our environments, our lived experiences, only considering that we want fresh air, then that's it. You know, that's the main concern. Like, just fresh air, how do we get there, right? And um, I think there is a slide, uh, again, connecting it to uh, COVID, that shows that uh, during COVID, uh, the air pollution levels actually um, got uh, better, meaning there was less pollution. I, I read a bunch of papers on this because I don't, didn't want to make a big, bold claim, but it's true. NO2, ozone, and uh, particle matter decreased uh, in multiple countries. Now, the last one uh, that I'm going to give an example of is play, right? Uh, so this is, again, um, from architecture. Uh, it's called a reversible destiny design, where the architects only thought about a home. And, Again, think about spending your COVID in a home like this as opposed to where you are right now. The entire house is designed so that you, you have to move and you have to climb and you have to bend over. And it's all, you know, uh, this idea of uh, actually their big idea is that you can, you know, kind of even combat death uh, with architecture. But I, I don't want to go that far. But basically, you know, um, you can bring texture, playfulness, and in, infinite non-stop play in your lived experience, right? And these are some of the architectural rending, renders of this, and they even took this to the next step, which basically is an example for how play could guide the design of an entire, you know, neighborhood. Um, basically, uh, they say on a bright sunny day, you go out for a stroll through an urban landscape, and um, your immediate vicinity, the architectural volumes, ignite sparks of determination and play and say natural, etc. Now I'm going to stop here. Uh, I'm already at 2:10. Uh, what we need to do next is uh, go back to these. I had this idea that uh, we would post these uh, colors uh, as uh, in the chat as JPEG files, so it'll be wildlife JPEG, affect JPEG, curiosity JPEG, and when you commit to a group, you will change your uh, background. But I don't want to force anyone. And some of you don't even have your cameras turned on. So um, uh, it's optional, but it will help me see who is in which group. Does this make sense to you guys? And I'm going to stop screen sharing at this point. All right, we have only this many people left. OK. Um, Maybe we don't even need to do this. Uh, so let me let me try uh, maybe assigning, and perhaps uh, Stephanie, we can take just notes and decide who's in which group. And we also have, I think, a Google Doc for this. So um, I would need a couple people to work on a city that's solely focusing on wildlife. And if you're not interested, that's fine. So who wants to take part in the wildlife group? Colleen, anyone to join Colleen? I'll actually take part in any group. Okay. You know, so well, yeah. I'm going to move to uh, something else. How about stargazing? 
I couldn't sell stargazing. How about, oh, Kim, who else wants to join Kim? Uh, as long as you're two people, it's, it's going to become a group. So who Me. else wants to speak? Who is that? Uh, Nico. Okay, hi, Nico. Great to see you. Nico and Kim will be on stargazing. The next one is going to be play. All right. Uh, anyone who wants to focus on play? I would do okay. play. Caleb, great. The, anybody wants to join Caleb? Designing and, you know, uh, a lived experience for, that's primarily focused on play. It'll be fun. This one is a fun one. Sarvani. Okay, Sarvani and Caleb are in the play group. That's great. Next one is going to be extreme heat. So this involves global warming, heat waves, wildfires. Mm -hmm. any, any buyers for extreme heat? <laughs> OK, I'm moving on to plant life. Any plant lovers who want to do this, uh, focusing on plant life? If not, I'm just going to assign this because I have three more left and then I'm running out of options. Uh, no, I, I didn't have any uh, uh, volunteers for that. The next one will be social trust. So how can we design environments that is entirely focused on social trust? And you can put this as the place that you've been maybe, I don't know, some, you know, uh, Nordic country where social trust is, you know, um, they score really high on social trust where you just leave your bike out and then go to the store, come back, nothing happens. You can always trust the person. You drop something, they find where you live three days later to bring it to you. You need, you know, uh, I don't know, something, some help. They just show up for you. They bring you soup. Think of like increased social trust experiences you had. So that's how we're going to approach this. Yeah. Okay, I go, don't. That could go really what? wrong. I said so that could go really wrong. Look at Singapore. It's because. They <laughs> because of the that's true that is true that's very true um so it, it doesn't have to be like uh, as i said it could as you colleen said it could go in different two directions um okay i'm gonna go over this i have curiosity designing for curiosity cities or lived experiences that will promote provoke i'll do curiosity, curiosity. Okay, Colleen is on in curiosity. I can join you, Colleen, there if no one else wants to join Colleen. Or I, I, can, see... I can also oh. move to other places. No, no, we have a volunteer. I just don't see the name because you don't have your name on your um, uh, on Zoom. Can Victoria. you please type your name? Victor? Victoria? Victoria. Okay, Victoria and Colleen are uh, in... Curiosity? Was it curiosity? Yeah, yeah curiosity. Okay. okay, great. And I have diversity next. Diversity. All right, now let's do this. Um, let me see who doesn't have a group yet. Because they have six people who signed up for groups. Who doesn't have a group yet? Julie, Kelsey, Liz, G, but maybe you guys aren't even here. It's hard to say. Julie, so yeah. do you want to team up with me on one of these? Uh, we have well, one I think I'll do, I'd be happy to do plants. I'd be happy to work with someone on plants. <laughs> on plants. Okay, yeah. any joiners for Julie to work on plants? If not, I can join you. All right, so I'm going to join Julie. So I think as far as I recall, and I might be wrong, we have plants, team of two. We have curiosity, team of two. And um, Amy says start. she'll do plants with me. So you could work with someone else on something else if you. OK, great. Julie and Amy are going to be in the plant group. And uh, I think we've reached you know, a satisfactory number of groups at this point, and given our time. Uh, I will be here for anyone who wants to work on anything else, especially G, Kelsey, I haven't, um, you know, heard from you. And uh, we will have, let's say, uh, half an hour or 25 minutes, actually, let's do it 25 minutes, to uh, brainstorm 
I believe you have Google Docs and um, Jonah just posted it. Uh, so the whole idea of cartographer, magician, analyst, now we're two people, uh, but perhaps, you know, after an initial discussion on what, what we want to see, one person could be like putting things together where the other one is like looking for images or references. Uh, and uh, the presentation is very simple. Here are a couple steps we can take towards, you know, a lived experience that's focusing on this is going to be uh, the, uh, I think, the path. All right, so I'm just going to start the timer here. It's 2.18. Let's wrap up around 242. You got it to work. I know it was it was incredible. Do you just do that by listening to what she was saying? Incredible, no? You're amazing. <laughs> um, I wonder if, should we transport into some of these groups or just, hello? Hi, Colleen. Sorry, my, my internet keeps going down, so I don't know what to do. Where were you, do you remember who, you were supposed to be with Victoria. Okay, I'm gonna, that's why they were abandoned here. I send you back. There you go. <sighs> but okay, I can't, I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't talk to Pinar. Well, now she, that she's in a group, yeah. Yeah, how bizarre. What kind of control room is this? Well, actually, it looks like you are in a control room based on your <laughs> background picture. <laughs> Those are my flying cards. <laughs> Just for. It was actually very appropriate for the slideshow. It's speculative. I have a speculative background. Um. I'm going to get myself a glass of water. Great. Experience. Um, That's cool. Yeah, I don't know. But I was going to like try to draw something, but I'm not a good drawer. It's I perfectly notion. fine. It is so short. So I think this is great. I love the notion of smell. We didn't even do that. We didn't even talk about that at all in ours. That's great. Multimodality. Yes. Uh, Sarvani came up with that. And um, it's, yeah, sorry. No, I just see Sarvani's chat. Did Sar do you want to add something, Sarvani? Because I. I I'm a little confused. Um, oh, okay. May not be able to talk. Got you. Okay, sorry. I didn't read the whole thing. Yep. Uh, I don't know. Any any other things I should clarify? I know we are running low on time. Yeah, let's keep going, and then we can have a more general conversation if there's time at the end. Yeah? Awesome. Uh, who do we have next? Stargazing. Me and Nico. Uh huh. So uh, uh, I'll start. I mean, we started our conversation about like the reasons why we chose stargazing, and uh, and we came to a. a where we would like a place where you have a, a place to go stargaze would be in a city. So th thinking about how we could accomplish that and how to design a city um, where you could go and you have a social contract that you turn the lights out at 10 p.m. and that um, and ways to reduce light emission. So 
Nico, you want to speak more about why we placed it? Like this border here you see is the, the city border with the, the round shape you see is the park uh, where we imagine it to be. And here you see that it's north um, facing. I mean, this is the north direction. And we chose this picture because we were trying to imagine a city where um, what would it would look like with reduced light. And we were also talking about this, um, how the, how complete darkness and a sense of safety are kind of opposites, but that um, when you, you get, you, you adjust to the, to the lack of light, you start seeing in very, you can, in very dark conditions, you develop something called visual purple that makes you um, adapt to it. And we were imagining the city in the northern hemisphere, which is why we placed this park in the in the on the southern border. So we would have um, the stars being in the zenith in the south. So have the to have the development in the um, the, the urban development in, in the north, towards the north. And um, yeah, we're also talking about measures um, such as, um, you know, this kind of paint that you would have on pavement or asphalt um, to, for, for signage that could um, charge the light in the, during daytime and then, and then give it off during um, during night at a very low level, so it wouldn't, you know, you would reduce light pollution, and so you would kind of um, uh, feel more safe in spite of the darkness and be able to um, connect more to your um, to your environment at, in the at night. And then I guess you could also imagine things like what could we do in terms of plants that attract night light. Um, wildlife at night like um, certain types of moths or also we had um, we do, um, the previous group was talking about smell so you also have certain kind of plants that um, only give off um, scent during the night so these are all considerations um, yeah I mean we didn't even get to talk about this but we were uh, as much but also thinking about um, building heights itself so and how you know how that would affect the visibility of this center space building a city surrounded uh, as a center place to to gather um to for stargazing but our, again this idea of community space uh considering the the sort of the, the safety concerns because i think cities are lit up i feel like a lot of the corners are lit up because people feel unsafe so, and the activity levels go up because we have so many lights and we drive at night, like all these activities at night. So social contract, I think is a big deal in a city like this, because are, are we gonna agree at 10 p.m.? We're gonna stop doing anything, lights go down. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, it's, the more I, we're discussing it, the more it, it, it's uh, exciting, but also problematic. Like how, how would we build that kind of a city? Where we would have that kind of social contract. Oh, but just also Nico mentioned there is a town in Austria that they do have this social contract and is for stargazing. I thought that was interesting. There is also one in Midwest. I was uh, searching for an example. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's Nido. I forgot the name, but they changed all their street lamps, and it's the one one spot in the United States where it's urban, but you can still see the stars or stargazing, Ooh. so I, I can, I it was in my notes, but I took out a bunch of slides, but I think this is, this is really great, a great start. So um, shall we move on in the interest of time to uh, Flora? Yeah, Amy and I did Flora. I'm gonna be the one talking because um, Amy was doing texting. I think she's got a similar situation to Sarvani. Um, so if you look at our image, we've got a lot of different things going on in it. Um, we want there to be a variety of trees. We want there to be edible gardens and non-edible gardens. There should be native plants. We don't want everything to be um, taken over by non-native plants. Um, there are 
I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's vertical gardens sort of towards the center of things. Um, there's sod roofs. You can see someone is um, trying to mow the lawn of the roof. Um, or, um, so there could be sod roofs. We'd like there to be some wild spaces. Um, you know, the whole idea of having grass really harkens back to landed gentry and the idea that you need to have sheep in order to have the industrial revolution happening and you need the wool. And we're not that kind of people anymore. We don't really need all this monocropping grass, which you know was lovely to play on, but isn't very functional for other things. Um, let's see, what else do I have in my notes if I can go down in there? Um, oh, right, we um, talked about um, water. We need a source of water for all these plants. Well, cities were traditionally built along the edges of waters, like the edges of rivers. So maybe this would be on the banks of a river and there would be canals running through. Um, we also realized that all these plants would need soil. So we would need to be removing concrete, just as the um, LA River has been rewilded in places by removal of concrete. We would want to have that happening in our city as well. Um, also, we need to be thinking about composting, and there are citywide initiatives with composting. If you look in the upper left corner of our image, we've got, this is um, a composting space in New York City, right by one of the bridges. Um, just to the right of that, there's something that looks like a globe with plants in it. That's actually something you can buy at IKEA to have your personal garden space, which takes up very little room. It's got vertical gardening. And you can have all the plants, you know, all the foodstuffs that you want to be growing for your family in something like that. What if, say, when you went to a mall or even to the, um, the lobby of some large building, as there are so many in, in cities, what if these were the things that you found in, your, in the middle of the mall or in your garden, in the lobby? And you could just pick some radishes because you're feeling a little peckish. Yeah, and I was, Julie, that makes me think that, so in the, in the post-COVID or living in the COVID world, we're not in these big buildings that are all over the place in cities and stuff. And so what, you could repurpose them and fill them with all of these kind of plant things and we could then have gardens. They would be full of gardens. That'd be kind of cool. Very yeah, cool. I gotta say, I wasn't really thinking about the whole post-COVID part of, of the, the city. I was just yeah. thinking about the making cities work for more plant life. Yeah. Um, but yes, <laughs> I mean, here at UCSD, <laughs> we're having a new school of public health. And um, one of the things that we are grappling with is what it's going to look like once we get to have buildings. And one of the things that I have already discussed with the incoming dean is the need to have um, to have edible plants because we actually, another thing that we have here at UCSD is a lot of hunger. Um, so trying to resolve that in ways. I liked the idea also, and I see a lot of public arts uh, commissions because I apply to them, never get any because my ideas are, you know, like in this direction. But what if we had, you know, public sculptures as uh, edible gardens, or you can give different, uh, you know, structural qualities to this too. So I love this. This is wonderful, Julie. Um, <clears throat> so it's 3 p.m. Uh, we have two more groups. Do we feel like going on and finishing these up? Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> Diversity is next. Okay, I'm going to talk since Kelsey did the typing. <laughs> um, we weren't thinking of the pre-COVID thing. We were just thinking like pushing out our ideas on diversity since we live in a, a modern type of city already. So we based our idea on that, having like a large city with lots of restaurants, markets, and museums to showcase different type of cultures and a lot of like festivals. I think we could do that like every every week or so to like, expose people to different types of food and maybe a mall or a shopping center to also do the same thing and showcase like like different garments people wear and people are, are more open to wearing those type of things and understanding the culture. Um, we will also have like open churches, mosques and temples so people can 
practice their religion freely, but like also be open to like new new people coming. And that's kind of like all we got for diversity. We weren't really thinking of like including like children and, and elderly into diversity because they're kind of like a given within their culture. But I guess it, it kind of combines like like the elderly are treated differently in different cultures, I suppose so. Yeah, that's very true. Well, you should take this list and hand it to UCSD diversity, whatever we have a branch for it now. And like, we want a night market. That'd be, that'd be great. Um, thank you so much, Eddie and Kelsey. Well, next is curiosity. Victoria, do you want a shot at it? Um, I'll just, I'll do the first part of the financial stability, I guess. Like, basically, my first observation with curiosity was um, that something that was a thing that prevented curiosity was uh, the lack of stability, whether it's financial or social, it kind of prevents a curiosity because curiosity inherently has a risk of failure and without stability there is no urge to uh, seek out failure you know because um, then you are always confronted with unknown and we're in a society that lives on stability which is why we kind of wanted to create spaces where it's failure isn't um, isn't as big of a consequence. It's not really a consequence, but it is almost a door to try new things. Uh, yeah, Colleen, you can add more. Yeah, that's great, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that was our opening. And then um, I think that, so some of the pictures that you see, one of the things that I was super curious about was this interactive display at the airport. And it made me really engage with it and, and play with it, try to figure out how it was kind of working. Um, and then, um, I don't know what the big story is to tell, but I think one of the things that we've, we're, so we were trying to think of things that would um, improve curiosity, but then we started talking about uh, what are curiosity killers and how can you then start to get rid of them within, uh, within a city. And so that mean that for one of those things was uh, traditional classrooms, right? So we wanted to el eliminate some of those. And if you have curiosity and you don't have a lot of money, how do you go about uh, understanding it. And that's what um, experimentation, low fidelity prototypes, um, Wizard of Ozing uh, kind of came into play. And that's why there's the picture of the seat suit there. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so you do, yeah. Well, to add to Victoria's uh, uh, fine, uh, uh, yeah, curiosity and um, boredom. Uh, or curiosity killers, uh, spaces, uh, classroom settings. We, we talked about classroom settings um, mm -hmm. and uh, spaces that promote collaboration, maybe a play area in a classroom setting. Uh, so we did talk about playfulness and its connection to curiosity. So Caleb, and yeah. there was one more person in Caleb's group. So we'll have to, you know, collaborate with you guys. Um, we'll also probably have to collaborate with stargazing team too, because the night is full of curious things, right? Um, but we can talk about... We have to add some smells, right? So if you're walking, smells make, a, make us curious too. Definitely. It definitely works. And um, we kind of hiding and revealing, the importance of hiding and re revealing uh, in terms of promoting uh, curiosity in that we are all actually kind of uh, you know born curious and we pick up languages very quickly and we want to just like animals we observe this in uh, animals around us as well we're just like looking for the new thing etc so how can we integrate this in our educational system was a question like can we teach languages sooner than later etc and um breaking the norm is a curiosity uh, to kind of enhance curiosity. But uh, I talk too much today, so I'm kind of rambling and I don't wanna take more of your time. Uh, Victoria and Colleen, is there something we would like to highlight more in our group? I don't think so. I, I, I think just in the amount of time that we had, 
uh, we were just kind of had ideas coming out and we were laying them out there. I don't know if we have any kind of story really to tell. Right. Well, we might end with a quote by Colleen herself. Hell for me is boredom. So <laughs> <laughs> how can we prevent, how, how can we design an environment so that Colleen doesn't feel like she's in hell? So that's, I guess, their ending note. <laughs> Amazing. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this session. Thank you so much, Pinar, for leading it, this wonderful exercise. Um, next up, next week, we have Lisa Cartwright running a session called Health Surveillance Infodemic, Design Fiction by Numbers, and really hope to see you all there. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Woo! Well, thank thank you. you for joining. You guys, you guys are great. This is very inspiring for me, too. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Stephanie, so much. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Is there anything I should do, or this is it? I can go now. You're great. We will share with you the transcript. Oh, there's going to be the very long transcript full of ums and uhs. <laughs> oh, well. It's so I'll see you next week. I'll join. I'll join um, Lisa's thing because I'm not teaching anymore. Thank you yeah. so much. Excellent. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>